Hello everyone and welcome to the Link podcast with me Elle and today I'm joined by another special guest Luke Truman of the YouTube channel also called Luke Truman. How are you Luke? Yeah I'm great thank you. Thank you so much for having me on and I'm uh, really excited to be here. Excellent well thank you so much for joining us. So your channel uh, I was perusing uh, today and <laughs> last week. <laughs> uh, you focus on Chinese. There's a little Spanish. Uh, so, and I read in your about that you taught yourself Cantonese from scratch. Now, as someone who I know you're from the UK, English is your first language. Seems to me like a language like Cantonese would be one of the more difficult languages you, sh- you could teach yourself <laughs> from scratch. So it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, how how did that happen? Uh, first, actually, why Cantonese? And then how did you go about teaching yourself Cantonese? Yeah, so um, I guess, so why Cantonese is kind of, for me, it was quite an obvious choice, although it might not be for most people. When I was at university, I played table tennis in the university club, so I was around a lot of people from Hong Kong. And then I became really close to this one girl who later became my girlfriend. Um, then we were dating after about two years I decided to start learning a bit of Cantonese because at the time I was going out for meals with her and her friends and I when they'd speak in Cantonese I had no idea what was going on so my original motivation I guess was just to really understand what the people around me were talking and when I'd go out for meals I'd always you know make an effort and speak to me in English maybe like one to one but I always felt kind of like not part of the group and left out of the conversations because I could never join in and whenever someone switched to English to speak to me, I always felt like they were accommodating me and I kind of felt a bit bad and a bit embarrassed. And also that if I'm going to be with this person, then I should probably try and learn their language. And so how did you go about, do you remember, I mean, this is, I know a number of years ago now, but how did you get into it? Because it's, I mean, you have to learn the, the Chinese characters. It seems really tough. I mean, I guess you have, you had friends and a girlfriend who was speaking Cantonese, so that helped. But um, what kind of method did you use to, to study Cantonese? Well, I guess for the first maybe month or so, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just kind of downloaded a few apps on my phone and just gave it a go. I remember I was sitting in the car on holiday. I think I was in Croatia at the time and I just started flicking through and trying to just learn a few words and that, you know, it was giving me words like car and stuff. And I did that little research about what Cantonese is. I didn't even know what a tone was. I didn't never heard of tones before. And when I was looking through the vocab, it was basically a few letters and then there was this number next to it. And now I know that the number was the tone, but at the time I didn't even know what the number was. So I just ignored it completely. And I was like, that's probably not that important. And then maybe, (laughs) yeah, and and now it kind of, did that for a few weeks and then kind of stopped and didn't really do anything because I didn't really get anywhere. And then um, I remember looking online and trying to Google how to learn Cantonese. Um, and this website kept on coming up over and over again, a website called CantoneseClass101.com. So they're run by um, Innovative Language, who also run, I guess, Chinese Pod 101. There's, they've got them in every language. I guess it's like Spanish class or Spanish pod or something. You know, they've got Italian class. They've got loads of languages and it's loads of kind of 10 to 15 minute podcasts with a short dialogue and then they have um, a complete transcript to the dialogue so I started that for a bit and then maybe about a week or two later I didn't really make any progress so I kind of just stopped again and then I was because I already had the subscription I was googling online you know how to learn Cantonese and I stumbled across this article by a polyglot called Ollie Richards who said Mm -hmm how to use Cantonese Class 101 to actually learn Cantonese. And I was like, okay, well, I have this program. I've bought it already. I didn't get anywhere before. So let's just see what this guy has to say. And he made the big point of basically don't spend any time with a podcast because that they're, they're just English waffle and you don't need to know any of it. You know, they're just taking 10 minutes to explain one grammar point and you get like maybe two or three words of Cantonese. It's just not enough. So instead... You want to shift your focus onto the dialogues and you want to read through many, many times. You want to listen to the dialogues and repeat. You want to look up all the words and you really want to just practice your ear and focus on listening a lot from the start. So I started doing Ollie's approach. He outlined in the, in the blog post and I started progressing quite fast, a lot more than what I was doing before. And I thought, OK, we're onto something here. So I took the same method and used it to apply to other resources like um, the Teach Yourself Cantonese Complete Beginner Course book um, and did that for a few months and then 
after that, I started speaking a little bit. So I started practicing. And again, my first few times on Skype, I didn't really know what I was doing. So most of the classes were in English. Um, kind of stumbled about a bit there. And then um, later, I stumbled across a website called AJAT. And I'm trying to remember of the timelines. I think I also discovered Steve at some point and his videos along that. I just discovered websites like AJAT. And they all emphasized the power, how powerful it is to immerse yourself in native audio and content and read and all that sort of stuff. So I then started putting an emphasis on watching a lot of dramas in Cantonese. Initially, I did it with English subs, subs titles for the first few months because my comprehension was really low. And then after a few months, I decided to kick the subtitles and rewatch the shows I've already watched because I already had the context for it. Um, so I did that for a few months and then... Maybe after I got to the point of about nine months, ten months, and I also used a few other resources um, that had like fast, full speed audio, but with the transcripts. Um, Cantonese Conversations by Ollie Richards again was really useful. And I started to kind of reach this. I felt like I've hit this ceiling in terms of how far my ability to comprehend was getting. So I could understand basic things, but my vocabulary was really small and I couldn't read and write. And if I wanted to jump into most native content and as I prepared for it, it was too difficult. So about nine months in, I started to learn Chinese characters. I found the book called Remembering the Traditional Hanzi by James Heisig or Remembering the Traditional Hanzi by James Heisig. Uh, I always pronounce it Z because that's the way the Cantonese word's pronounced. Uh, okay. um, I got called out for it before in a video, so I want to state <laughs> that's why. <laughs> um, and, and yes, well, I, I learned... Um, Characters that way, it basically teaches you the 1,500 most characters um, in terms of breaking them down into components. And mm. why it does, doesn't teach you pronunciation, I basically gained the ability to write 1,500 characters by hand and break them down. So instead of looking at a bunch of squealy lines, I see, you know, I look at that and it's part A plus part B. It's not just a bunch of lines that mm. have no meaning anymore. So when I went into reading after that and I started with short content with lots of audio and you know short chapters so i could go through it and that worked really well and i started picking up vocabulary really quickly now i could read i could text with my friends i could you know look for subtitles and do all this stuff i could read comic books i could read books not not at first but after a lot of time i started to build up to that and i started to pick up words a lot quicker so then it was just a lot of consuming as much content as i physically can and speaking as much as i can basically from there on out and i did that for about two years overall and got to uh, like a pretty comfortable level to the point when I could go out with my friends and easily join in, in the conversation out for dinner I can read a few I read a few novels in Cantonese that weren't crazy fantasy genre or anything like that but they were like set in real life and I still had enough uh, vocabulary to kind of follow what was going along in that so that's more or less what I did for uh, Cantonese. Wow and to pick up on a few things you said there did you say you it, you learned to write 1500 Chinese characters? Did I hear you say that? Yeah, uh, with, with the first <laughs> book, yeah. So I did. Um, oh wow. I did more since then because I studied the second book, which has another fifteen hundred. And then when I was studying Mandarin after, I went to Taiwan for a year, and we had to write out a lot of essays by hand, and we did a lot of handwriting oh. for that. But at the time, I only did the first one thousand five hundred. Um, I don't think the second book's really worth it. I think the second book was pretty much a waste mm. of time. But maybe oh, we can okay. get into that later. Okay. <laughs> and so how many how many Chinese characters would you say you you know like you could write at any given time? Uh, well, it varies a lot. So because I haven't okay. really practiced um, writing up by hand since. I, so I went mm. for sabbatical for a year to study in Taiwan for Mandarin. Um, when I left Taiwan at the time, I they basically had our tests would give us a news article to read and would read it and then basically write out what our opinion is on the article and we'll just write it out by hand. Um, so I could kind of do that at the time, but there was a lot of forgetting characters and paraphrasing or mm. forgetting a character and then looking in the question to see if they'd written out the character that I'd forgotten and you could kind of copy it. So there was like, yeah. you know, there was uh, things like that, but I actually kind of stumble my way through and a bit of forgetting sometimes get uh, some of the part of some of the um, radicals or sorry the components the wrong way around mm. and stuff um but in terms of recognizing characters uh, again I, I don't really use any sort of online system now so i don't track any of that but i can read most um novels now as long as they're not too 
archaic in the language they use. So some of mm-hmm. the older books, there's this really popular um, novelist from Hong Kong called Jin Young who writes a lot about martial arts novels and it's because they're quite old and in the way like it's set in historical times. They use a lot of weird language that kind of is sort of half classical Chinese. So if it, as long as it doesn't go to that sort of uh, language use, I tend to be okay now. Um, yeah. Wow. I, could, I just can't imagine writing. It's a, an amazing accomplishment, I think, to be able to just write. Because I feel as though a lot of people who uh, study the Chinese, you know, Cantonese, Mandarin or Japanese, maybe don't go down the path of learning how to write the characters because um, it's really involved. It takes a lot of time and maybe we're not, you won't really need to, to do it ever. You can just use, you just, you're on your computer or your phone. So um, that's a really, it's a really cool skill to have, I think. Wow. Um, yeah, I completely agree. It, it's not that practical yeah. and you forget them really quickly, but it was kind of fun. So I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, it must totally help with, the, I mean, say impractical, I guess, kind of, but it's it must help with the other aspects of learning the language. I mean, you're writing it out. So that's also reading and, you know, yeah, it, it helps for sure. I, I enjoyed that aspect of learning Japanese for sure. But when you said 1500 and the fact that you know more than that to write out, I just blows me away i think i could write like a hundred <laughs> when i stopped uh, studying mm-hmm. chinese characters kanji <laughs> anyway i'm very impressed um so then after cantonese did you move straight on to studying mandarin or was there or were there any languages in between yeah so i was planning a trip to mexico with my family so i and there was also a few uh, spanish dramas i wanted to watch so i thought you know let's just try and learn Spanish for a little bit so I gave myself a kind of timeline of half a year to try and see how far I could get and I just basically used similar methods to Cantonese um, and just started really trying to just immerse myself as much as I can. Um, I used Link a lot for Spanish which I found brilliant. I really like the feature of being able to import YouTube videos Mm. and then having the audio just so easily transferring to my phone in the app and just having a playlist of all the things that I downloaded and going through on a system like that, it's really easy to look at words. So, and with something when there's a lot of cognates, you know, I can at a relatively early stage jump into really interesting but short content and just do a lot of intensive work with that. And that, that's what that I found really enjoyable. So I did that for about half a year. Hmm. Excellent. And then you moved on to the Mandarin. All yeah. right. All right. Mm-hmm. And so how, how similar are Cantonese and Mandarin? Uh, well... The, the the biggest overlap is obviously the the Chinese characters are, are the same. Um, this is always a complicated thing to explain, but effectively, um, standard written Chinese, which is basically based off Mandarin, is the formal um, written language in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and that is the same. Obviously, you have the traditional simplified character split, but in terms of the grammar and the word choice, it's the same across all of them. And it doesn't matter if you speak Taiwanese, it doesn't matter if you speak Cantonese or Hokkien or I don't know, Shanganese or Mandarin, you'll write the same way. And that's kind of how Mandarin's worded. So it's based off that. Um, with Cantonese, you can write it out colloquially as it's spoken, but that's really rare and only really seen in things like maybe in YouTube comments or texting or comic books and mm. stuff like that. There are some novels, but they're rare. Um, so that's the biggest overlap. And then I guess the other bigger, biggest overlap is just in terms of, you know, vocabulary. So a lot of things sound really similar. So if you take a common word, for example, like ni hao, in Mandarin means hello. In Cantonese, you can pronounce it nei hao. So it kind of sounds close enough that you can kind of guess. And that helps um, really speed up the ability to improve your comprehension by quite a lot. Um, the things that always tripped me up is the endings of words. The A, O sound and O, U sound almost seem to be a one-for-one swap. So if it's an A, O in Mandarin, it's an O, U in Cantonese and vice versa, and it just seems to like swap you around. So for example, I don't know, um, head in Cantonese is Tao, and in Mandarin it's Tol. So if you're trying to swap between the two, it's almost, for every word, it's just kind of like the inverse with enough exceptions to trip you up. (laughs) <laughs> so do you find that you get you get tripped up a lot when you're because you're actively your language right now that you're studying and really immersed in is mandarin 
right? Mm -hmm. And so do you find you're often using the Cantonese? Yeah, I mean, when I was in Taiwan for like the first, I did four semesters there. And I think on my first day in class, on semester one, two and three, I had different teachers. And then the teacher said on day one, Wait, do you know Cantonese? And they said that on like basically every semester until my last one when I got a bit better with fixing my weird accent. Um, so they could obviously tell with the way I pronounced certain words wrongly right. that it was kind of more towards the Cantonese pronunciation. Um, for example, the one for time is shi ho, and in Mandarin it's si hao. So I'd always say shi hao and kind of have that ao sound in Cantonese when it should be shi ho. And I'd do that a lot, and that would be the most common one. You can probably click on any of my Mandarin speaking videos and see uh, remnants of it there still. Um, so yeah, I, I find that quite confusing, but I have gotten a lot better now. Um, I do still make mistakes, but it's it's less of an issue now. Mm-hmm. Uh, for anyone listening who maybe is on the journey of studying uh, Cantonese or Mandarin, or is thinking maybe they want to give it a go, because it is, it's a scary thought, I think, especially coming from an English as a first language point of view. Um, it's People say it's a very difficult language to learn. They both are. Uh, do you have any tips for anyone who is thinking about maybe starting that journey of, of learning to read the characters or just, just learning uh, Cantonese or Mandarin? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess um, with... A lot of these things I kind of think sometimes we're our own worst enemy. So like one quote I really liked by I think it was Muhammad Ali said, um, it's not the mountains ahead that wear us out, it's the pebble in our shoe. You know, stuff like that. I th- feel like that a lot of the time. We spend so much time worrying about how hard it's going to be that if we just started it and got going, you know, it w- would start progressing quicker than we thought. And then as soon as you start progressing and you feel that, you're going to be motivated to carry on. So it's kind of like that first bit before you feel any tangible progress is the bit that you're most likely to give up in so i feel like if you can just get started and feel some progress then you're gonna be motivated and want to carry on at least that's what happened to me um and when i didn't feel progress by using inefficient methods then i did give up after like a week or two because i I thought well this is just pointless i'm not going anywhere Mm -hmm. um i think the big thing for me is don't be so worried about what you can and can't say to begin with because like you said it's the sounds are very different the tones are very different the characters are very different and it's all very new and I found it takes a long time for me to get used to so I think just regardless of whether you learn characters or not I feel like putting a big emphasis on listening at the start is very useful um and with the characters I did use a book called Remembering the Traditional Hanzi by James Heisig which he has a kanji version which teaches like I think all the Joyu kanji which is something like 2000 the Mandarin one was 1500 I don't think it's necessarily actually I don't think it's necessarily relevant to learn that many characters in one go in the start at the beginning because it is quite dry so unless you're really mm. big like hands a nerd then maybe you don't do that. I think there's lots of really good courses out there that teach you the fundamentals of how characters work with only a few hundred and then once you kind of get that basic knowledge you can just move on. So you know once you understand that okay well on most of them are sound plus meaning. So you have a sound component of the character that tells you roughly how it's pronounced and you have a meaning that's, you know, so for example, it might be tongue, which is the one for copper. You've got the gold bit on the right and the one that looks kind of like a cave. It was Heisig. It was, it's a cave on that and it's pronounced tongue as well. So, you know, that's the sound. That's the meaning. Most characters are like that. And once you kind of get used to that in your head and you know what the basic uh, elements are, it's a lot easier. So... There are a few courses out there you can try that with. There's um, a book that Vladimir Skolty wrote, which teaches about 300 characters. He had a PhD in Chinese characters. That that I've heard really good things about that. There's Outlier Chinese. They did a course also about 300 characters long. That Again, he's got, a, I think, a PhD in Chinese phonology and lots of crazy stuff. And I've got an interview with him on my channel. And he's, his knowledge on Mandarin just completely blew my mind like he's a very smart guy so his course is very very good as well so just picking anything like that and just getting a basic idea of what they are and then just trying to jump into just reading and when you're first getting started preferably something with audio is better because then Mm. you can you can kind of try and pair up the audio and the characters and not kind of put so much strain on your brain to 
recall sounds that you may or may not be able to remember. Right. Well, there we have it, guys. Some excellent advice there. Some great uh, content. I'll put uh, links in the description too for anyone who is interested in checking those out. Uh, you mentioned interviews on your channel just there, and you have some excellent ones, I see. Uh, is there anyone, though, who you would love, I was wondering, who would love to have on your channel? It can be, you know, unrealistic, like, you know, the Pope or something. <laughs> is there anyone you'd love to have on? <laughs> um, yeah, and if so, and uh, who and why? I mean, yeah, I think Pope Speaks in Chinese would be a great clickbait and I'd get oh so many goodness. views off that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> In the uh, Chinese um, sphere, I guess, someone that I kind of looked up to a lot was Dashan, which translates to like Big Mountain. He's this Canadian comedian. Well, he was born in Canada, lives in China and has done for like maybe like 30, 40 years. And he speaks absolutely phenomenal. And it's not that he just speaks like a native. He also makes lots of jokes and you know he's standing in front of a crowd of thousands of Chinese people making them all laugh it's just yeah. completely blows my mind every time I watch one of his performances so yeah I would love to get him on um maybe more realistic um there's also this other I think he's a polyglot he speaks a few languages called uh, Lao Ma on YouTube who again speaks really kind of a cloak like really um authentic northern accent in China and he has really, really good pronunciation. He has lots of videos teaching English pronunciation to Chinese people. He's lived there for a long time and he speaks really good. So I'd love to get Lao Ma on the channel as well if uh, if I got the opportunity. Well, fingers crossed. Um, to, to go back to the Daoshan, da is that his name? It's, it's Dashan. Like, it's like Big Mountain. Da, yeah. Dashan. Uh, I feel yeah. like making people laugh in in the language you know that making other people who understand that language laugh is like the ultimate i feel <laughs> you know as it's so nuanced you know comedy in in different cultures so mm -hmm. yeah i imagine that uh, would be it just just would be an amazing feeling so and he's canadian yeah. you said i he was born in canada yeah pretty sure he's canada oh, okay. yeah pretty sure oh very cool okay well uh all of these great pieces of content that you have mentioned i will put in the description and also a link to your channel for anyone who's interested in checking it out thank you so much for joining us today luke thank you so much for having me on i really enjoyed it cheers bye bye bye